much for joining us this Saturday evening for Science Gallery Bengaluru's public lecture series at Psyche. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a new institution for public engagement with research established with the founding support of the government of Karnataka. Psyche is our fifth exhibition season and third season, which is completely online. Psyche explores the complexities of the human mind. And over the past few weeks, we have, through our public lecture series, been looking at this from diverse disciplinary perspectives. Uh, this evening, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Somitra Patkare, who deliver his lecture titled, A Silent Crisis, Suicide Amongst Young People in India. Somitra Patkare is a consultant psychiatrist and director, Center for Mental Health Law and Policy. In the past, he has provided technical assistance to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the government of India, in drafting India's new Mental Health Care Act 2017, which takes a rights-based approach to mental health care. He has also served as a World Health Organization consultant in many low- and middle-income countries, assisting them in drafting and implementing mental health legislation and national mental health policies. Dr. Pathare is also the co-director of SPIRIT, a research project on suicide prevention funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and the co-lead on Outlook, a youth suicide prevention project funded by Comic Relief UK. I'd also just like to mention that this program does deal with a sensitive subject matter such as suicide, which might be triggering for the participants. We are going to be putting links in the chat where you can reach out for help for yourself or anyone that you know. Um, before we begin the lecture, I'd also like to let our visitors know that we have uh, more programs coming up this weekend. Tomorrow, we have Hamlet's live episode six. So this is the final episode in the series with a performance by Anujag Sarkar. This is 5 p.m. on Sunday. And uh, later on Sunday evening, we have a lecture by Professor Vidita Vedya on serotonergic psychedelics, a revival. And this is at 6.30 p.m. in the evening. I'd also like to remind the audience that at the end of the lecture, we will have an interactive Q&A session. So please remember that you can add your questions in the Q&A box. And do fill out the feedback form. It would be great for us to get your thoughts on the lecture and what we might do better programming going forward. I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Patare. Uh, thank, thank you, Madhushri. Thank you, Madhushri. And thanks to Science Gallery for asking me to do this talk. Uh, I know that most of you are non-professionals. And so I'm going to try and tailor the talk and make sense of the data and the research uh, in a way that people who are non-technical could also understand it. Uh, but before I start the talk, let me just try and share my screen. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, so I, I was going to talk to you about suicides among young people. Uh, and as uh, Madhushri mentioned, you know, just warning people that this can be distressing for some people, either because of their own personal experience of or of uh, suicides or attempted suicides or someone near and dear to them or a friend or a colleague. So if it is going to be very distressing, then maybe this is the time you want to actually opt out. Or alternatively, if you feel you want to go through but get distressed at any stage, then do remember that the helpline numbers are available and you can talk to someone who can help you if you're feeling distressed uh, because of this discussion. So what I'm going to talk about, okay, I'm going to this is broadly the kind of headings that I had for my talk. First of all, I was going to give you a fair idea of what is the suicide crisis globally. Uh, then talk about suicide in, in India, especially among young people. Uh, discuss some of the gaps in suicide prevention in India. Uh, at the same time, talk about some success stories in suicide prevention. And uh, finally, end by giving you some case studies on a couple of our projects that Madhushri mentioned just now. Uh, talk about some important future directions for where research and policy should be going. And then we can have some discussion or if you had any questions that needed to be sorted, then I'm happy to try and answer those. So, so what is happening with suicides? Okay, uh, about uh, about eight hundred thousand deaths worldwide across across the uh, year, per year. Now, you know that might be an underestimate. So, if you wanted to take a round figure, then you're looking at about a million deaths a year uh, due to suicide. It's the third leading cause of uh, years of life lost globally. Uh, in in young people, it is the second leading cause of death. 
uh, in young people aged 15 to 29, globally, it is the second leading cause of death. Uh, and majority of these suicides, which is nearly 80% of these suicides, actually uh, happen uh, in low and middle income countries, uh, including places like India. And, and you'll be surprised to know, but suicides in absolute numbers uh, increased by a staggering 40% from 1990 to 2016. Uh, now, <clears throat> I know that our population numbers have gone up, and so the rate may not have increased, but there is an actual increase in the rate uh, of suicides too during this period. And what, what is extremely worried and why India should be concerned about this whole issue is that uh, India accounts for almost about 30 to 33% of the world's suicides. And that's what is estimated by all international authorities, including the World Health Organization. Uh, although we only make up 17% of the global population. So really, in a way, our suicide rates are almost twice the suicide rates uh, of what would be expected as based on our contribution to the world population. You know, if you are 17% of the world's population, we should probably be 17% of the world's suicides if you were at the average, but we are not, we are almost double the number. Uh, and, and so that, that's a major challenge for us. The other uh, worrying factor is the fact that while, uh, while at all age groups, uh, men die more of suicide than women, uh, Indian women make up more than 36% of the world's suicides by women. So among women, India's contribution is actually higher to the global suicide numbers uh, than it is with men who make up 24.3% of all the men who die by suicide. So, so you'll see that both these numbers are higher. We should be, both these numbers should be at 17% if we were keeping up with the world or, or, or even lower. Uh, both these numbers are higher, but our women's numbers are especially higher. Uh, one out of three women who die of suicide in the world happens to be uh, an Indian woman, and especially young Indian women. Now, the other issue that we don't really talk about or address uh, is that uh, attempted suicides. You know, we don't even collect data on attempted suicides. What does that mean? Attempted suicides mean somebody uh, who attempted to kill themselves but survived. Uh, now, they may not have wanted to die or they may have wanted to die. But if you take a neutral definition, anyone who survived after a suicide attempt has attempted suicides, then globally, what we know is that about uh, attempted suicides tend to be about four times to 20 times the number of suicide deaths. OK, so in some countries, the number of attempted suicides is four times the total suicide deaths. Uh, in other countries, that can be as high as 20 times. So that's your range, four to 20 times the suicide death numbers. Uh, now in India, we don't collect uh, attempted suicide data. So we actually don't know how many attempted suicides we have in India, but we could try and estimate using this. So let's say uh, India's suicides range anywhere from 1,35,000 a year, which is NCRB data. And actually this is from, from 2019 uh, and the 2020 data is about one and a half lakh, uh, one point five, three lakhs uh, for 2020. Uh, and, and the global burden of disease estimated India suicide rates as about at about two and a half lakhs or 2.6 lakhs. So now if you multiply the lowest number of suicides by the lowest number of attempted suicides, and you multiply the highest number of suicides uh, reported by the GBD, for example, and multiply it by the highest multiplier of 20, then really attempted suicides in India range anywhere between half a million per year to 5 million per year. Now you'll see this is such a broad range. Uh, and clearly the amount of healthcare costs that are involved with uh, people who attempt suicide uh, is of a magnitude of many, many millions or billions of rupees that are spent. Uh, in fact, there is uh, evidence that many families might end up in poverty uh, because of the expenses associated with the treatment of someone who has attempted suicide. So clearly attempted suicides is a big, uh, big factor and a big contributor, which does not come into our discourse when we are talking about suicides. We only talk about, uh, about people who died by suicide, but there's also a large number of people who don't die by suicides, uh, but actually survive, uh, but have huge healthcare costs. And this is not collected by anybody. So if you're talking about the whole suicide issue, we should really be talking about not only deaths by suicide, 
but also the attempted suicides. And then you will see that we are talking about huge numbers, anywhere from half a million uh, to up to five million people affected each year. And this is a quote from uh, from a study which was published uh, by by Rakhi Dandona, who works at the uh, Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, and she was basically looking at uh, the, the global burden of disease data for suicides from 1990 to 2016. So this is a long 25 year period uh, that she was looking at. And, and what you see is, and she highlights this very well, that suicide ranks as the first cause of death in both age groups of 15 to 39 years and 15 to 29 years. So in both these age groups, suicide is the number one cause of death. Uh, while internationally, uh, it is second or third rank in these age groups. So clearly, uh, you know, India's young adults are, are dying by suicide in high and alarming numbers, and it is a public health crisis. Uh, however, we've really not seen it as a public health crisis. And in fact, uh, and, and as I will make this point even later on, that we have largely seen it as a either a law and order issue or as a charity issue, rather than to take it as an approach that this is a public health issue which we should address with clearly public health uh, standards of providing care. And so that that's something that I wanted to really highlight. If you if you look from 2016 onwards, what has happened from 2016 onwards? Uh, the suicides in the general population. So if you take the entire population in India, suicides uh, have increased. Okay, but if you look at children, that's children under 18 years, then suicides have increased by uh, by four percent higher than what it has increased in the general population. So over the last four years, five years. Uh, suicides went up by about 18% in the general population, but they've gone up by about 22% uh, in, under, in the under 18 year olds. Now, you, you could say that this might be explained by the fact that India is a young country and, and India's under 18 population is growing faster than India's uh, general population. And so these figures might be explained by that. But I'm not getting into the rates issue. I'm just talking about the absolute numbers. And you'll see the absolute numbers are also horrifying. Uh, in 2020, uh, the number is about 11,400 children under the age of 18. Uh, that's roughly around 310 or 320 kids dying by suicide each day. Okay, uh, And you can divide that by 24 uh, to think how many kids under the age of 18 are going to die by suicide by the time I finish this lecture in an hour's time. Uh, so these are huge alarming numbers, which we've not really uh, addressed very well. And, and uh, one of the things that uh, what you see is if you did percentage increases between 2019 and 20, remember 2020 was the uh, was the pandemic year. You know, that's when we had the pandemic. And recently, the National Crime Records Bureau published the suicide data for uh, for 2020. And what you see is a dramatic, okay, uh, a dramatic 10% increase in suicides from 2019 to 2020. Now, why do I say dramatic? Uh, because in the years prior to that, for the last four or five years before 2019, Suicide rates were increasing at like 1%, 1%, one percent, half percent, one and a half percent. So they were kind of at that one to two percent mark and, and kind of flitting in that increased numbers. And then you suddenly see a 10% increase. India has not seen a 10% increase in suicide numbers year on year for many, many, many decades. Okay, so this is a, a hugely alarming figure. Uh, and if we know what we know from research data is that suicide numbers increase uh, with a certain time lag after an economic crisis, for example. So one would Im imagine that the numbers will continue to increase in 21, 22, 23 uh, before they start tapering off. Uh, and that's how it has been in other uh, countries too. Uh, what is also important to realize is that suicide rates in high income countries, you know, in the West or, or in uh, Australia, with the exception of probably Japan, which is a high income country, suicide rates did not go up. Uh, during the pandemic year, whereas suicide rates in countries like India and other low and middle income countries, including countries in South Asia around us, 
did go up. And, and many people have speculated that this might have to do something to do with uh, the kind of social protection and financial protection that was provided in high income countries, uh, as opposed to low income countries. And that's, that's an open speculation. You can't really prove these things, but, but there is a certain association between the two. Uh, what is even more worrying from the 2020 figures is that while the suicides among the population went up by 10%, suicides under 18 went up by 18.5%, almost double the number of, uh, double the increase that is seen in the general population. So clearly, uh, COVID-19 pandemic had a very specific and negative impact on, on the under 18-year-olds uh, in this country. Uh, you know, that's a double uh, of an increase. And that, that's even more worrying uh, from many perspectives. So, you know, people will immediately say, oh, you know, it's something uh, under 18, the cause of suicides is what? Exam failures. You know, that's usually if you ask people, why why do young people or, or children kill themselves? And they'll talk about young, uh, they'll talk about uh, exam failures. Now, now, clearly the impact of the pandemic was that schools and colleges were sco closed and exams were frequently deferred by universities. Uh, and exams were sometimes even conducted online and the stress of not passing an exam no longer existed. So what you see in 2020, and that keeps, uh, that's in keeping with this understanding that under the 18 year olds, suicides due to failure in exam actually fell. So, you know, it reduced by about 28%. So exam failure suicides went down by 28%, while the total suicides went up by 18.5%. You can see uh, how much of an impact uh, we've seen of the COVID pandemic. Exam failures are down. Even among the 18 to 30 year olds, if you see failure in exam as a cause of suicide, uh, it fell, it reduced by almost 21%. Uh, so, so clearly uh, the examination system does have a certain role. And here is a natural experiment that we got to see because of the COVID uh, crisis and schools and colleges being closed and exams not being conducted, that you could see the effect of not having exams, that exam failures uh, reduce suicides dramatically. But what I want to also point out to you is the absolute numbers. If you look at the absolute numbers, exam failures, suicides among the 18 year olds, even previously only constituted about 10 to 15 percent of the total suicides. In fact, if you look at the 2020 number, it is 1129. And on the previous slide, as you will see, the total number of suicides under 18 are 11396. So that's about a 10 percent number. So even if we reduced and removed all the exam suicides, you know, if you did everything possible for exam suicides uh, and got rid of exam suicides, you would only prevent 10 percent of the deaths. The 90% of the deaths are not due to exam suicides and are not due to the exam stress. And there are other factors uh, which actually impact uh, on suicides. Now, uh, look, look at what Tamil Nadu did. And this is a very well-known uh, uh, example of trying to reduce exam suicides. You know, Tamil Nadu uh, introduced a supplemental exam system, which means that if, if uh, students fail the board exam, uh, then they can write the exam immediately within a month so that they don't lose an academic year and they can go ahead with their peers. And then if you look at the suicide numbers due to exam failure before the introduction of the exams, uh, which was around 400, uh, has come down to around 200. Uh, it, this, is for, this is data for Tamil Nadu specifically. Uh, while the number of students who are writing this exam has almost doubled. So while the students doing this ex board exams has doubled over the 10, 15 year period, the number of suicides have halved, which really means that you reduce the suicides by almost 75% of the number of suicides due to exam failure. So there are ways you can actually reduce uh, uh, suicides uh, by introducing policy measures in the education sector. Uh, and this is a recurring issue that I would like to come to during my talk, that if we want to reduce suicides in our country and especially reduce suicides among young people, then really the most effective interventions actually exist outside the health sector. You know, they exist in education, uh, they exist in the employment sector, they exist in the social justice sector, they exist in the agriculture sector. So all of the interventions which are likely to reduce suicides in our country are, are, are most likely to be from sectors other than health, 
And so uh, we need to really start taking a more intersectoral approach to how we look at suicides. What are the common risk factors? You know, young women, uh, what are the common risk factors for, for, uh, for death uh, by suicide? And here's, here's a list of all of these kind of uh, risk factors. Uh, young age and marriage, which is very common for women, debt, unemployment, uh, exposure to violence and abuse within the home. Now, this is a very important factor for women. In fact, one third of women who die by suicide in our country have a history of uh, what is called as domestic violence, have a history of having survived domestic violence. One out of three women. Uh, chronic physical illness is also another factor. Uh, the lack of formal education in some sort of way might also contribute uh, and make you at risk for suicide. Obviously, family and personal history of mental illness, that doesn't require stating that, that mental illness is a contributor to, to uh, suicides. And finally, the most important one is substance abuse or substance use disorders or alcohol use. Now, this is a very important factor for men, actually. Uh, you know, a third of men, one third of men who die by suicide have a history of alcohol use or alcohol misuse. Uh, prior to suicide. So if we really wanted to focus on the factors which uh, lead to significantly, which are significantly associated with suicide in India, uh, for women, it's domestic violence. For men, it's alcohol and substance use disorders. And if we could rely on those, if we can focus on those, then those are something that we will definitely be able to make a difference. Uh, things like debt, unemployment, chronic physical illnesses, uh, these are not gender specific. They are they're across the board uh, for men and for women. There's also a gender gap. You know, I always get asked, why are you focusing on women when in absolute numbers, uh, men die more than uh, women by suicide? Now that is, that, while that is true across the data, it's not actually true for every age group. So under 18 year olds, for example, girls outnumber boys in term, numbers of suicide. Uh, and then the ratio starts to increase gradually and increases from around two, two times, twice as number of men dying of suicide in the 18 to 40 year olds and goes up to four times uh, in the above 60 year olds. But the reason to talk about women uh, and, and, and suicides is because uh, the, the ratio in India is lower than in, in other countries because more women are dying of suicide rather than more men, less men are dying of suicide. So, so for women, uh, suicide is a leading cause of death, uh, whereas it is the second leading cause of death for men uh, in the same age group. Uh, so clearly for women, you know, we, we've done so well with our other health conditions like maternal mortality, which used to contribute hugely to suicides, uh, usually to deaths, uh, that it has come, uh, come down now. And so suicide has become the number one cause of death uh, for, for young women in this age group. Uh, there's also a recent report from Kerala where they investigated all the maternal deaths that happened, you know, deaths that happened during pregnancy before uh, pregnant before delivery and just after delivery. Uh, and about 17% of those maternal deaths uh, were due to suicide. Uh, so a significant chunk of those deaths are also because of suicide. Uh, and that's something that I wanted to highlight to you. Uh, I'm not going to labor on this point, but basically what I'm trying to get at is uh, that young women make up a huge chunk of the suicides, you know, whereas young men do not make up so much of suicide. So in case of women, it is younger women dying of suicides. In case of men, it is older men dying of suicides. It's a broad generalization, uh, but that's what you will see happening. So it's younger women versus older men. And, and why are married women more at risk for suicide? You know, uh, there, there's always a saying in mental health that marriage is very protective for men, uh, but marriage is actually not protective for women. Uh, so married women are more at risk uh, than non-married or widowed women in India. And these are some of the reasons why they are, uh, you know, low social status, child marriage, economic dependency, uh, early motherhood, uh, interpersonal violence that I touched upon, forced marriages, um, alcohol use in partners. So alcohol use among husbands, for example, or men uh, in the household, uh, which is not only a risk factor for men's suicide, there's also an increased risk factor for women's uh, suicides.
Now, if you look at attempted uh, suicides, you know, let's look at attempted suicides. What are the risk factors? And is, this is some studies that I've, and you'll see that exposure to violence uh, increases your odds, increases your chances of an attempt uh, by almost six times. You know, the odds of an attempt uh, after exposure to violence in the family is much higher. And as you will see uh, in, this, in this particular graph or in this particular slide, what I want to highlight the fact is what are called CMDs. CMDs means common mental disorders. You see, common mental disorders increase your chances of attempted suicide by about twice. Okay, So you have twice the odds of attempting a suicide versus somebody who doesn't have a common mental disorder. But you'll see it is the lowest multiplier among all of these other factors, such as exposure to violence, age at marriage, uh, chronic physical illness, uh, migration, uh, and whether the family is in debt or not. And hunger is the only one which is almost similar to CMD. So, so the point I want to make here really is that while we focus on mental illness and we should rightly focus on mental illness, the fact is that all of these other factors uh, increase your risk of attempted suicide by far higher uh, odds uh, than, than what common mental disorders does. Uh, here, here is another uh, you know, another study which looked at a different set of uh, uh, risk factors for attempted suicides. And what you find here is, you know, unemployment increased your odds by almost 16 times. So you're 16 times more likely to attempt suicide if you're unemployed, uh, whereas these other ones had much lower uh, odds of uh, attempting suicide. So again, the picture that comes out is that uh, suicides is not purely a mental health issue. It's a societal issue. It's an intersectoral issue and, and interventions need to be uh, intersectoral. So what is missing from the Indian data? There's a lot of stuff which is missing uh, from the Indian data. We don't have longitudinal studies. What happens to people after an attempted suicide, for example? Uh, you know, across the world, uh, an attempted suicide in, is one of the best predictors of a future death by suicide. Now, we don't follow up people who have attempted suicide, so we don't know what happens to them. Uh, we don't know what is the relationship between an attempted suicide or the risks for attempted suicide versus the risks for a death by suicide. And again, we haven't really looked for uh, what are the possible social or policy interventions uh, that could reduce suicide, for example, reducing access to pesticides uh, or domestic violence interventions. How do they reduce suicides or do they reduce suicides? Uh, and if they do, by how much do they reduce suicides? So uh, you heard all of this and I'm sure some of you will say, oh, this is wonderful. This is stuff that government should be doing. This is stuff that researchers like you should be doing. Uh, this is stuff that policymakers should be doing something about. Uh, what, what can I do as an individual? What, what should I be doing? I mean, how can I contribute in my own small little way uh, to suicide prevention? And here's a list of uh, things that you might want to look for, okay? These are signs to look out for. Again, these are not definitive signs, these are pointers. So if you see somebody indulging in reckless behavior, if you see withdrawal from activities, uh, isolating from loved ones, or you see someone searching online for methods to kill oneself, uh, putting their personal businesses in order and visiting friends, family to say goodbye, uh, giving away their prized possessions to friends, for example, or suddenly deciding to make a will, uh, or either obviously directly or indirectly expressing suicidal intent. Now, these are clearly uh, hints and indicators for you to think that these are people who might be uh, at a risk for suicide. What, what can you then do? Uh, and, and these are some of the things that I really... Uh, wanted to kind of uh, make it clear to you because these are some myths people have. One of the myths that people have is that, oh, you should not ask someone about suicide. Uh, you know, if you feel that they are at risk, but you should not ask because if you ask people about suicide, you will give them ideas about suicide. This is completely untrue. Research shows that actually asking someone about suicide actually makes them feel much better. They realize that you've created a space for them to open up and you might actually save a life. OK, uh, the, the other thing that is a myth sometimes which happens is, you know, somebody is depressed and they're getting treatment for depression and then you suddenly see uh, they're getting better. Uh, and, and that is probably the time when people are most at risk of dying. So, you know, someone who's really uh, depressed, withdrawn and then suddenly starts becoming cheerful, you really need to take that as a 
as a as a little bit of a uh, an amber light to think are they at risk of suicide uh, you know and not everyone who seems happy really is so don't worry you work on the basis that oh you know this guy this person seems so happy why should they've got everything in their life everything is sorted out um, why should they die of suicide happiness uh, or success actually has very little uh, to do with suicides uh, and and you know don't ignore warning signs i mean there there are these uh, warning signs which you uh, really can't afford to ignore uh, don't assume that you cannot help uh, you know 80% of people or 80 to 90% of people who die by suicide uh, will have been in contact with some healthcare service provider in the 12 months before uh, and most people who die by suicide uh, will have expressed their suicidal idea or suicidal intent uh, either to a colleague or to a family member or to a professional. So anyone who says that, the answer to that is not to say, oh, don't think like that. Uh, the answer to that really is to say, okay, can we sit down and talk about this? Uh, and talking to someone about suicide is not going to make them more likely to die. In fact, research shows it is likely to make them less likely to die. So what are the problems that we see in India? You know, why, why is suicide prevention in India? Where are the gaps? Uh, the first is the lack of research funding to explore these social determinants that I talked about, you know, unemployment, uh, domestic violence, the use of alcohol, all of these issues are social determinants to suicide. We really don't have a lot of research funding for this. We've not really done the studies that are required uh, to understand where uh, where these issues might be and for which groups, what might be risk factors. You know, the risk factors for a child under the age of 18 is likely to be very different to the risk factors for somebody who is in their 60s, for example. And clearly, if you're doing a suicide prevention program, you would have to have different interventions to target these different groups. Uh, we have very limited intersectoral efforts to address suicide. You know, the standard response when you talk to policymakers or even our general population, when you say, oh, you know, suicides are a problem and you say, what should we do? Then everyone will say, oh, we need more helplines. We need more counseling helplines, uh, which is not actually solving the problem uh, in a way because uh, you're not actually addressing the the you know, it's only the proximate event that you're trying to address without actually addressing the uh, the the distal events that might lead to people making uh, an attempt. Like if I were to use the example of uh, road traffic accidents on a highway, uh, you know, you, you could always, if you had a hotspot for accidents, you could place an ambulance there and have doctors there and you will save some lives. But maybe what you need to actually say, is also look at, why are, why is that a hot spot? What is wrong with the design of the road? Uh, do we need more lighting in that area? Is there something wrong with the way drivers are trained? Should we be doing something about driver training to prevent uh, accidents happening at that hot spot? So what happens is the ambulances on the road is not a solution to the accident. Uh, you need to also be doing other stuff. This is not to say you don't need an ambulance at a at a accident hotspot. Similarly, I'm not trying to say you don't need a counseling helpline or suicide prevention helplines. But that is not the whole picture, and that is a very limited part of the jigsaw uh, of trying to solve uh, the suicide problems that we have in our country. Uh, and finally, the whole thing is about the lack of implementation research. We really don't know. Like, for example, let's take the what, what, what I mean by implementation research. We really don't know. Let's say take uh, suicide prevention helplines. Who does it help? Uh, do we know whether it only helps a certain age group or a certain gender or certain people from certain uh, geographies, uh, say urban people or rural people, or who does it help? Uh, we don't know how does it help? What happened to these people, for example, and how did it help? So very often we don't really work out uh, these implementation research questions because we really don't invest uh, uh, much in trying to understand how we could prevent uh, suicide. And, and I'm going to give you just two quick examples uh, of suicide prevention success stories. You know, Brazil is a great example of cash transfers uh, as a story. And uh, so let me tell you about Brazil because I just love that program. Uh, uh, in 2003, uh, Brazil uh, introduced what is called as a conditional cash transfer program. Uh, and, and basically, uh, over time, over the next 15, 20 years, 
uh, they had collected data on about 100 million people. Okay, now Brazil's population is 200 million people, but over time, over the two over the two decades that the program has now been running, they have data on almost 100 million people who either received these cash transfers uh, at various points in their lives. And what does it show that people who received a cash transfer versus people who did not receive the cash transfer? Suicide rates among those who received a cash transfer was 61% lower, 61, okay? Not 16, not six, but 61%. So, you know, basically the cash transfers meant that for something like six out of 10 people who would have died of suicide did not die of suicide compared to the group which did not receive the cash transfer. And this is a study over 15 years with a large cohort. So this is a pretty solid, robust kind of a finding. Again, proving my point that very often the intervention that you need may not be a health sector intervention. In fact, uh, I don't know of any study where or any intervention in the health sector which has proven that uh, it can reduce suicides by 60%. Uh, a similar study from Indonesia, where they targeted the 10% of the population which was poorest, uh, even there, cash transfers to the poorest 10% of the population brought down suicide rates in that population by 20%. So, you know, 20%, 60%, these are large numbers of reducing suicides. Uh, uh, in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, they limited access to pesticides. I know Sri Lanka has been in the news because of this whole organic farming uh, issue. But long before the organic farming, for the last 15 years, Sri Lanka has been banning uh, what, what the WHO asks for them to ban and asks all countries to ban, which are the most hazardous class one pesticides. Uh, and so Sri Lanka, as well as Bangladesh, managed to bring down their suicide rates substantially during this period. So, uh, so clearly, uh, interventions. Now, the first intervention is a social justice department intervention. The second intervention in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh is an agricultural sector uh, intervention or an industry intervention. So clearly both interventions outside the health sector, which bring about substantial reductions in suicides. So I'm going to now end in the next five minutes, uh, just telling you a little bit more about our studies. Uh, SPIRIT is a study which is looking at an integrated suicide prevention program. So we are trying three different things. Uh, one is a training program for adolescents who are in the ninth and 10th grade at school uh, to increase awareness of mental health, develop coping strategies and encourage support seeking behavior when they're distressed. Uh, we also provide access to community storage facilities for farming households uh, to safely store their pesticides. So, you know, they can store their pesticides in a, in a locker, a safe locker, which is kept in the panchayat office uh, so that it's not easily accessible at home if somebody were to attempt suicide. And then we are training community health workers to identify, assess, and support and refer people who are at risk of self-harm and suicide. So, you know, training them, how do you identify someone who's at risk? And what do you do when you identify someone who's at risk? So it's an integrated intervention, uh, which has been tested out across about 120 villages to see whether it reduces suicides in those villages. Uh, Engage is another a uh, study that we are uh, involved in, which is being uh, done along with in collaboration with the government of Chhattisgarh. Uh, it's an online gatekeeper training program. You know what are gatekeepers? Gatekeepers are people who uh, might be in a position to prevent suicides because they come in contact with large numbers of uh, pub general public. Uh, and who can then be trained. So school teachers are an example of gatekeepers. Policemen is another example of gatekeepers or police women. Uh, so we are trying out a gatekeeper training program for secondary and higher secondary school teachers in the public uh, education system to identify, support and refer adolescents who might be at risk for suicide prevention. And what we are trying to do is to try out two or three different ways of doing it, you know, to deliver it online, to provide them with mentoring, uh, to see the, the idea behind this is to see which way of delivering a training program like this actually is able to reduce uh, brings about change in, in the school teacher's behavior, as well as reducing uh, the number of suicides. And, and, you know, India has a lot to do. If you, the sustainable development goals, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which India, including all other UN countries have signed up to, one of the targets for the sustainable development goals is that by 2030, 
uh, countries and the world is supposed to uh, reduce uh, suicide, reduce premature mortality from non-communicable diseases by one third, and that and the indicator for this target is the suicide rate. You know, one of the indicators for the target of reducing one by one third is suicide rate. Now, India contributes one third of the world's suicides. If if India's suicides do not go down, there is no way. Uh, that the rest of the world is going to see a reduction in suicides. You know, if 30% of the suicides which are coming from India don't go down, uh, you can do the math and work out how much the rest of the 70% of suicides will have to go down so that you get a total 30% reduction. And that would mean all countries have to reduce their suicides by close to 50 or 60% uh, to compensate for the fact that India has not reduced its suicides. Uh, you know, there's been a research publication uh, which estimated the chances of various states in India meeting these targets. And actually, it's very low. Uh, and the chances that India will hit this target by 2030 is very close to zero uh, if we do not take action just now uh, to try and do something about it. This is a this is the last three seconds of a uh, of a commercial break from me, which is that uh, here is a book that uh, a couple of my colleagues, uh, Abhijit Narkarni, who is a psychiatrist and and a, an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also works in Sangat Goa, and Amrita Tripathi, who's a a uh, journalist who has published about mental health issues before, we got together and wrote a book uh, called Life Interrupted. And the idea is to actually uh, talk about all of the things that I talked to you in the last 45 minutes in a much more broader sense, to look at evidence-based strategies, to look at things that uh, policymakers, journalists, and various stakeholder groups can do to provide better solutions uh, and save precious lives in India. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me patiently. I'm happy to take questions. I'm going to hand. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen uh, and hand it back to Madhushree to take us through the rest of the rest of this discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Patale. Uh, I think this was a great step, at least for us, to begin uh, this conversation in a public space and. Uh, I there were a couple of questions already in the um, Q and A box while you were speaking, so we can uh, probably start off with those. And I'd like to encourage the audience, both here and on our YouTube channel, if you have any questions, to drop it in. You know, we let's let's begin this discussion. Sure. Um, uh -huh. I think the the first question that came in uh, very early on was, I think, when you were talking about the data about attempted suicides and uh, one of the <coughs> viewers has visitors has written that attempting suicide in India is criminal offense so that means any attempt would be registered so then how come then how is it that there are no estimates for the number of attempted suicides that, that's a good question um, uh, you know uh, you're right uh, until recently uh, the mental health care act has changed the situation uh, that attempted suicide uh, is not necessarily a, a criminal offense, uh, but uh, but yes, until until 2017 it was. And so why uh, why don't we have the numbers? Well, I, I I'll tell you why we don't have the numbers. By the way, uh, uh, the National Crime Records Bureau also publishes numbers on on attempted suicide separately, not in the not in the uh, ADSI, the accidents and death by suicides. Uh, 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 document that they produce, and and I think they 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 publish numbers which say that there were like thousand or fifteen hundred or two thousand attempted suicides. The reason that happens is because most of these cases do not get registered. In fact, if you talk to the clinicians across the country, uh, they will tell you that uh, what uh, what would happen in many cases is that they are that they are patients who had been admitted with attempted suicide. The families. Uh, face certain amount of harassment from the uh, law enforcement authorities. And then these cases are all hushed up uh, for various kind of gratifications that might be handed out to people. So they do not get registered at all. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the drivers for uh, the Mental Health Care Act to try and include this attempt at uh, decriminalizing suicide was the fact that 
uh, criminalizing suicide has not actually prevented people from attempting suicide. In fact, the data from many countries like Sri Lanka and Singapore has been that, uh, Sri Lanka especially, has been that when you decriminalize suicide, actually suicides go down, they don't go up. Um, so, so yeah, that's why what, what happens. So many of these do not get registered at all. So that's why you get such low numbers. You know, the number of attempted suicides are in the range of 2,000, 3,000 a year, nothing more than that. Okay. Um, the, the next question that we got during the talk was from Gaurav and his question was, uh, you know, his sort of question <laughs> is around uh, what a suicide attempt consists of, right? Do we just consider one event in a very small time frame as a suicide attempt? For instance, people who uh, with substance abuse disorders who, and who might refuse to seek help for any reason, or uh, there is a high is every instance of high risk behavior a suicide attempt? And uh, I mean, I'm not sure if this question is entirely clear, but I think uh, we well, get I, I kind of get what 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 the questioner Gaurav Dutta is trying to say. Uh, you know, I, I would try to limit it to a very narrow idea of what is a suicide attempt and not broaden the definition of suicide attempt uh, to all, uh, everything and everyone indulging in high-risk behavior because clearly you what happens when you do that is one is you inflate the numbers uh, and secondly, it just actually uh, dilutes the urgency of attempt of the reality of the people who are attempting suicide or trying to kill themselves. So I, I would not, I mean, I understand where you're coming from and I understand that, yes, that is a risk factor that we should be looking at and addressing the risk factor, but I wouldn't call it a suicide attempt, you know, just because somebody indulged in high risk behavior. Okay. Um, Shati as well has a question and I think this comes from what we were talking about, the understanding the effectiveness of implementation. So is there any data on how effective domestic abuse helplines are? Oh, I, I, I presume you mean how effective domestic abuse helplines are in preventing suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that specifically, mm -hmm. I don't think there is any data. I haven't come across that data. So remember, uh, it's very difficult to do these kind of studies. You know, how do you say, see if you, uh, what happens is if you prevent a suicide, then nothing has happened. You see, when nothing has happened, uh, it's always a difficult thing. So that requires much larger studies and requires complicated designs in which you'll be able to do it. Uh, again, it just highlights the fact that we have very little research funding as well as research interest uh, in looking at how things might help uh, uh, prevent suicide. Uh, very often what we, what we work on is the basis that well, it makes common sense. If you have a if you have a helpline, then it must be preventing suicides. What is the alternative? Shouldn't we have a helpline? You know, that's the kind of conversation that you end up with when you say, well, we need some more research. We need to really know how it is effective. Who is it effective for? When is it effective? Now, these are questions we don't really look into or research at the moment. So, uh, I, I, I'd like to encourage any others who have questions to add it in the Q&A box, but maybe I could ask you a question in the meanwhile, because you, know, you spoke about what individuals can look out for and what individuals can do. And uh, I guess also ourselves being an institution that deals mostly with young adults, that's you know the age group we want to work with. And uh, you, know, you, you did speak a bit about how teachers can are gatekeepers and how say schools or universities where you, know, where you come into contact with a lot of young adults may have some role to play in this or can have a role to play. What about uh, you know, public spaces or you know, spaces like museums, galleries, spaces like us? What could we be, you know, how could we become a part of you know, thinking about this or proactively uh, you know, be a part of some kind of intervention solution. Um, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I think we're like like this event today that we are doing. Now that's a that's a great thing. You know, if you're going to bring this to public consciousness, that's a great thing. Uh, I think uh, curating a lot of personal stories, for example, uh, and putting them up is another. Uh, a great idea and especially stories of recovery stories of recovery from people who uh, may have attempted suicide and then went on to live and did very well 
uh, again, that might be something that actually uh, uh, not only uh, spreads hope, but also uh, gets rid of this other myth. You know, there's this myth that people who want to kill themselves will eventually kill themselves. And you'll realize that that's a myth. Uh, most people do not want to kill themselves. And when that time has passed, they're actually thankful they survived. Uh, and many of them go on to live long and very successful lives. Uh, so it will also address the myth that, that people want to kill themselves. So I think, I mean, a couple of things that just come to mind as we are talking, I'm sure there are many uh, more things that you can do. Uh, one of the things that I, since you brought up, what can, what can people do and what can you do? One of the projects that I did not mention, uh, but you did say in my introduction was the Outlive project, which is run by a colleague of mine. Uh, and Outlive is an interesting uh, project because it's working in three large urban cities, Delhi, Pune and Mumbai. Uh, and the idea is to train peer mentors. Uh, you know, so the idea is to go to colleges, uh, educational institutions and train young people as peer mentors, peer, peer counselors, so as to speak, who are then available for anyone who is feeling suicidal. So instead of using a suicide uh, uh, helpline, what we would end up using is some kind of uh, using a social media process uh, to do a chat helpline, you know, something, let's say on a WhatsApp or something like that, uh, uh, an app which allows you to chat with these uh, mentors who are always available on that chat. Someone is available who will talk to you if you're feeling suicidal. And the idea being there being that uh, young people can relate to other young people and you relate to your peers much better because your peers, you feel that your peers will understand your problems far better than somebody who's much older than you. Uh, and also uh, to increase the pool of people who are available. You know, otherwise you're trying to rely on specialists and experts and there's such a big shortage. So you can use uh, young peers and train them and supervise them and provide them with mentoring and support. Uh, and they could actually remember all suicide prevention helplines in this country are run by volunteers anyway. They're not run by specialists. Uh, so clearly uh, that's a very well proven model that if you train people who are volunteers who are not necessarily mental health professionals, they can do a pretty good job. I think, I mean, along the lines of that, uh, you know, the, the helplines that you were speaking about, and this probably I feel might connect back to the myth busting you did in, in the middle of your talk, uh, is that, you know, uh, one of the questions that's come up is that a lot of these helpline numbers come with terms, are, are called suicide prevention helplines. So can these kind, can this kind of wording or captioning be triggering for the an individual having suicidal thoughts in the middle of the night? And do we need better vocabularies or better ways of presenting this? But I guess this talks to what you said already, right? About the word. Yeah, yeah I mean, your thoughts really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I don't agree with this. I think, uh, you know, calling it suicide prevention helpline is not going to trigger anybody. In fact, it, if anything, it will likely mean that somebody knows, okay, here is some help somewhere where I can get help. Uh, and, and calling it something else uh, uh, is not going to change that. Some of the, uh, of course, there is a language around suicide that needs to change, okay? Uh, but changing the title of a helpline from suicide prevention uh, helpline to, to something else is not going to help. So, for example, uh, getting uh, our media to not use language like committed suicide. Okay, now we've been campaigning a lot to do that because committed suicide somehow implies uh, some kind of a criminal act because that's a language that's commonly used uh, with criminality, for example, committed a crime. Uh, and so getting, so changing language there definitely uh, makes uh, sense, you know, um, but, but changing language uh, across a, way, a variety of things. In fact, if there are any journalists online, uh, one of the things that I would like to kind of pitch for just now is the fact that uh, if you go to my center's website, uh, we actually have a free online course um, designed for Indian journalists. Uh, it's not very long. You can do it from the uh, from the comfort of your own home, and you can do it in a modular way. It takes about five to ten hours to complete uh, on how you should report suicide. You know how you should be reporting. How should the media be reporting suicide uh, so that it does not act as a trigger? Uh, you know, research shows that. Uh, uh, about uh, one to two percent of suicides uh, in the world could be prevented 
uh, if uh, only media reported suicides in a more uh, sensible manner. Uh, now, one to two percent might sound like a small number, uh, but if you got about 800,000 suicides in the world, you're looking at saving anywhere between 8,000 to 16,000 lives. Uh, or in the Indian context, you're looking at saving anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 lives uh, without having to invest any money into it. Uh, you just get journalists to report uh, and use the appropriate language when they're reporting suicide. Now, that, that, that's worth two to 5,000 lives saved every year. Uh, you know, it's a low-hanging fruit that we should really be uh, picking up very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, we don't have too much time, but there is one question that's sort of, uh, you know, on my mind before we uh, wrap up, you know. Uh, you, I mean, many of you would have heard about how, you know, there are, of course, several students who said, but also not just in research institutions as well. This is something that has, you know, come up or... Uh, especially in the recent past, it's been on, on a rise. And I guess my question coming from there is also that, you know, once an incident like this occurs, right, there's also an impact on the community or, of, you know, the, the rest of the people who are around the person who's no longer there and the institution. And often it ends up becoming a sort of, there's a blame game. There's a, there's a whole sort of thing that happens that, uh, the cause or you know being able to investigate the cause or to make positive steps towards uh, preventing such things from occurring gets lost in all that so in terms of supporting uh, you know the young adult community who is also affected by the uh, in, by this incident when it occurs uh, what do you think can be you know do you think it has an impact on those who are around them and whether there should be something also done to you know support and see what yeah yeah i mean of course it has an impact in fact uh, you know this is an impact not only for the for colleagues say in education institution for example family members who are survivors yeah. you know uh, it's the same thing so what is called as postvention support now we don't provide any support to family members you know while we might have suicide prevention helplines there's hardly any programs except a handful of few which work in small areas which work with family survivors of suicide, you know, where somebody in your family has died by suicide. Uh, and you can imagine the amount of guilt and shame and uh, mental trauma that they have suffered, but we provide them with zero support. Uh, and, and, you know, we know that every suicide uh, affects at least 15 people around them. Uh, so if you think that there is one suicide, then you're looking at 15 people who actually need help after that suicide. Uh, so we don't do that at all. I mean, that that's also down to this whole, uh, one is uh, myths and the other is also this whole, what I call omerita around suicide. We like to keep suicide silent. We like to keep it quiet. We don't like to talk about suicide. You know, it's not something that is spoken in polite company. When we wrote the book, uh, one of the things that I remember saying that uh, I would like to see this in your drawing table, uh, you know, in your drawing rooms on the table. Uh, because we need to bring these conversations into our drawing rooms. We need to start talking about it. You know, the first step to doing something about it is actually acknowledging there is a problem, talking about it, and looking at how we can engage everybody into this. Now, unfortunately, education institutions don't do that, but policymakers are equally to blame, okay? Uh, my interaction with policymakers, I find that very often they don't really want to do much about suicide because there is this feeling, you know, that somebody who wants to kill themselves will ultimately kill themselves. And you can't prevent every suicide. So then why get involved with a losing cause? You know, so sometimes maybe we should be talking about suicide reductions rather than suicide prevention so that it doesn't feel, so that people don't feel they have to bring it to zero. You know, policymakers very often feel, oh my God, if one suicide also means my prevention program has not succeeded, well, you will never prevent that one suicide anyway. So you're trying to actually reduce suicides, not say prevent every single suicide. Although that's your ultimate goal, uh, not reaching that next tomorrow morning does not mean you failed it. Yeah. No, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pathare. I think this is a good uh, point for us to, you know, uh, bring the session to a close. I think this was a really important discussion for us to have, and I hope that uh, those who attended today's lecture um, have something to think about uh, going forward, and this would lead to more conversations about this topic. 
and if uh, if you did find this lecture or uh, something of interest there is another talk that we have called an unlivable life state and corporate violence in the making of suicide by social scientist china mose which will explore what it might mean to understand suicide as a symptom of state and corporate violence so do tune in for that as well and um, consider signing up for a masterclass titled teenage riot analyzing the adolescent brain by um, Psych psychiatrist bharat kola from nimhans which will cover emerging research in understanding the development of the brain especially in the teenage years um i'd also like to remind all our audience to uh, you know who've engaged and asked questions today to please fill in the feedback form register for our programs and uh, visit the exhibition the exhibition is on for a couple more uh, few more weeks uh, please do check it out there are a lot of resources a lot of interesting things over there as well to think about um, so do please have a look at it um again thank you so much dr patare for this um conversation and i hope that you know uh, this will be a starting point and it will helpful for those who were here today to start thinking about this um, thank you topic. bye bye thank, thank you so much everyone Thank you.